The following program is a production of Truth for the World. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words I hear him say. Hello, welcome to The Final Word. If you follow us, you know that on The Final Word, we take God's Word on a subject and we study it in depth until we come to a final conclusion or the final word on that subject. In the religious world, there seems to be many different answers to some of the most simple questions that man has. Yet, God has given us His Word so that we can all come to the same conclusions. He wants us all to be united in the truth. His Word teaches us the truth. The, the problem is that man has so often changed the Word of God or, or misused His Word until it makes unity seem impossible. But it's not impossible. And so, at the final word, we research the questions from a biblical perspective, and we come to the answer that God has already given us in His Word. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Is that a possibility? Well, I believe that it is. I believe it is a command, and we need to follow it. Uh, the question today is, how do we have unity when everyone seems so contrary to one another? Uh, denominations don't teach the same thing. People don't have the same mind. So how can unity be attained? Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 3, he said, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring. Uh, that word shows us that there is an eagerness to be united and a work towards unity. Unity does not just happen. It takes work on the part of people to be able to live together. But let's go back for a moment and put ourselves in the midst of the Jews and the Gentiles. On one hand, you have Gentiles. They're off worshiping in paganism. They have different gods. They do unholy and ungodly things during their pagan worship services, things that are base and, and disgusting. In Corinth and in Ephesus, they worshiped many different gods and, and, and idols. Now, that's on one hand. Uh, then you have, on the other hand, Jews who had been separated from everyone. They had been worshiping the true and living God. Of course, many of them misunderstanding the law. But now you bring those two together, both of them despising one another. Well, that's what's going on here. Now let's try to get them to live together right here today. Paul says you have to get them living together in peace. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, the only way it can be done is by the Spirit of God, by His Word, changing attitudes and hearts and everyone joining together to teach the same thing. We are so thankful that Brother Curtis Cates is back again to present another lesson from God's Word on the unity of the Spirit. God's plan for unity. If we want to know what the Holy Spirit has to do with unity, the unity of the Spirit, then we go to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, where Paul said, and if you want to turn there, that would be great, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthily of the vocation or the calling wherein, wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Now, notice that he said, I plead with you, I beg you, I beseech you to walk worthily now, there are some people that say, well, we can't walk worthily. We can't be worthy of salvation. Well, you know, Christ didn't know anything about that. 
Because if we were to go over to the book of Revelation, we would read about uh, one of the congregations that had not denied the faith. Uh, a few names. Notice in uh, chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 4, But thou hast a few names in Sardis that did not defile their garments. And they shall walk with me in white. For what? For they are worthy. He that overcometh shall be thus arrayed in white garments, and I will in no wise blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And so through God's grace, we can walk worthily of the vocation where until we were called. And notice with all lowliness. Brethren, this, uh, these first three verses demonstrate and, and show us the proper attitude for unity. If God's people are going to be united in various places and overall, we're going to have to have the right attitude. And one of those attitudes is humility. Humility. Pride will not produce unity. Pride goeth before destruction. That's certainly true in the church of the Lord. Worrying about who gets the credit. I remember one time when Annette and I were preaching in Warrior, Alabama. There was a nurse, member of the congregation, who worked at Dr. Dan McCarms. And in fact, Dan, Dan, our son Dan's named for him. But anyway, Sister Kathleen Mitchell uh, was his nurse, one of them. I went in one day and I had a shot. I think it was a tetanus shot. And uh, I was wondering, how, how much is a shot? Now this is back in the 60s. And uh, Sister Kathleen said, uh, just go on, Brother Kate, so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have, okay? Well, I got the idea, hey, we'll let you know, you know, uh, how much it is. Well, about uh, several weeks later, it hit me, man, I haven't found out how much that shot is. I haven't even paid them for the shot. He didn't accept anything for treating us. I mentioned Sister Kathleen when she was going out the door at the uh, close of one of the services at the church, and she said, Brother Keats, I was hoping that you'd forget that. I took care of that. I pay, I'd paid for your tetanus shot. I, I, I wanted to do that for you. Well, she, she didn't want the credit. You know, he that giveth a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord, the Lord will remember. It'll not go unnoticed. And so, so we need to be humble. We need to be servants of others and not worry about who gets the credit. With lowliness and meekness, that's strength under control. Being able to control ourselves and stand for the truth, and yet have the milk of human kindness, and long-suffering. Suffer long. Do we in the church suffer long with one another? And have patience with one another? And try to work with one another? And understand, hey, you know, Christians have good days and bad days just like other folks. Forbearing one another in love. And love is that bond that holds us together. Giving diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so when we think about unity, 
These are some attitudes that we are going to have to have. And then he goes into the seven ones of the unity of the Spirit. I want you to notice when Dad drew up this chart, he noticed each one of these characteristics, these, these uh, areas of unity, and then he pointed out in each one of these ones here, the seven ones, what each one of these ones will produce. What kind of unity it will bring about in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, our Lord doesn't like division. In John chapter 17, he said, Neither pray I for these apostles alone, but for all of them which shall believe on me through their word, that they may be one. And here's Christ's pray to the prayer to his Father. Even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know why there's so many atheists in this world? I'll tell you. Because all of the, the people, or many of the people, uh, who claim to be following Christ are not following Christ. They're fighting each other tooth and nail and and uh, like two cats that are with their tails tied together, thrown over a clothesline. And brethren, that doesn't impress the world. Sometimes I've heard people say, well, if that's what Christianity is, rule me out. I don't want to be a part of that. And then in verse 23, he prayed that they may be perfected into one. Now that's an important prayer, brethren. And how is that produced? It's produced by the seven ones. It's produced by the word of the Spirit. Neither pray I thee for these alone, but for also for them who shall believe on me through their word that they may be one. So we have to give heed to the word of God, don't we? We have to live it in our individual lives and live it in our collective lives as we work together in, in a congregation. And in the church, the various congregations in association with one another throughout the world. In 1 John 1, 3 and following, I find that not only am I united when I obey the gospel of Christ with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, but I'm also united automatically with everyone who is united with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Now how does this happen? Through obedience to the truth, right? But our Lord abhors division. When the Apostle Paul wrote the church in Corinth, and he had established it, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he pleaded with them, I beseech you, brethren, that there be no divisions among you, that you all speak the same thing, that you have the same mind and the same judgment. In fact, it was so terrible. The division was until in 1 Corinthians 11, 18 and following, he said, when you come together, it is not even possible for you to partake of the Lord's Supper, the American Standard Version says. Now that kind of division is terrible, isn't it? You can't even partake of the Lord's Supper. Outside of the worship, you are divided, you don't even love one another. Some of you were li lifted up with pride till you're not concerned with each, each other's attitude. And then you come into the service and you claim to partake of the one bread which represents the one body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, the unity of God's people. And on the outside of the worship, you're making a mockery out of unity. 
When you come together, it is not possible to eat the Lord's Supper. And so hurriedly, our time is rapidly passing. We want to speak concerning these seven ones and what each one of them, what area of unity is noticed in each one of them. I won't be able to deal with all these scriptures. I wish I could. First, he talks about the one God. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we find that there are many lords, many gods in this world. Small g, there are many gods. Those things, those persons whom people put first. There are lords many and gods many, but there's only one true and living God, and there's just one Lord. And so there is only one Lord, there's only one God that made heaven and earth. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah, one Lord. Therefore thou shalt love him with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. God will not accept divided allegiance. We can't love him on the level that we love our family. And boy, I love our, my family. We can't love him on the level that we love our physical possessions. I tell you, he's going to be first. In Exodus 20, we find, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. God is a jealous God. And Christ said, If you love father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife more than me, you're not fit to be my disciple. We love God supremely. And then that shows us how to love our mates and love our children and love our families, our mothers and dads, and our neighbors as ourselves. But we have to love the Lord supremely. He will not accept second place. He will not. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, what does that mean? That means unity of worship. We heard a tremendous sermon this morning on worship. I benefited from it. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. We find that God seeketh such to worship him, for God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In Matthew 4.10, we find that Christ was tempted. He said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. Do we want to be united in the spirit? We're going to have to honor and love supremely our one God. And we will worship Him. And that will bring about unity. But then in the second place, there's one Lord. As we said in 1 Corinthians 8, there are many lords, small l, people who lord it over others. But there's only one living Lord, just like there's only one living God, the Father. And I'll tell you, that Lord has to be honored. And when we honor our Lord, then that brings unity of authority. Who has, who's the authority in religion? In Matthew 28, 18, Christ said, 
All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. In Matthew 17, 5, when Christ is on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know what Peter suggested when Moses and Elijah appeared? He said, let's build three tents here, three places of worship and honor. Let's build one for Moses and one for Elijah and one for Christ. Oh, let me tell you something. The Lord quickly put the quietus on that. There was a voice out of heaven that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Don't hear the law of Moses of the Old Testament. Don't hear the prophets in the Old Testament. You listen to Jesus Christ and you follow His will. You follow the apostles' doctrine. And then in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God in times past spake through Moses and the prophets and so forth. But now He has spoken to us through His Son by whom He built all things and so forth. In Matthew, uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, when Peter and John are preaching in the temple, he said, Moses, they said, Moses said, a prophet like unto me shall God raise up. Him shall ye hear in all things. You don't think that brings unity? When you have the unity of the authority of Jesus Christ, one Lord, one ruler, one king. Yes, sir. But then, one spirit. In John 16, 13 and John 14, 26, we find that Christ talking to the apostles said that he would send, pray the Father, he send the Holy Spirit, who shall guide you into all truth. Revelation 2, 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, we're to be led by the Spirit. Now what does that mean? That means unity of life. How are you living? How am I living? Do we want unity among God's people? Do we want unity in following Jesus Christ? Then we're going to have to have unity in life. We're going to have to ha say no to the world. And we're going to have to obey Jesus Christ and walk in the law of the Spirit. And when we do that, what will it bring? It will bring unity of life. In Romans chapter 8, Verses 1 and 2, there's now no condemnation to them that walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. The law of the sin of uh, the uh, Spirit of life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We're to walk after the Spirit. We're not to walk after the flesh. Romans 8, 9 and verse 11 in uh, John 6, 63. Christ said the words of the Spirit, they are spirit and they are life. And so notice that the one Spirit brings unity of life. And what does that mean? That means we have spiritual life in Christ in walking after the will of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful to Brother Cates for his help in our study on unity. We notice from his lesson today that in reality there are two things that we can do to be united. The first is having the right attitude, an attitude of humility. I have known lots of churches to split and split and, and split, not because of some doctrinal difference, but because people had prideful attitudes. And so if we want unity, as, as Brother Cates talked about, we must have the right attitude, but also uh, if I might sort of summarize what he was spelling out for us, we must all agree upon the same source, and, and that is God and His Word. Jesus hates division. He prayed in John chapter 17 that we all could be united just as He and His Father are one. He wants us to be one as well. Denominations have caused split after split after split because they have gone away from the simple truth, 
found in the Holy Bible. Paul also begged for unity. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And Paul tells us we can be unified. And I know that today if people would have the right attitude, and would come together to discuss the truth of the Word of God, and then the end result would be unity. Now you might want to know what you need to do to become a child of God. I'm glad to help you out in this. The Bible is clear. First of all, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Secondly, you should repent. That is, you change your mind, and that change of mind brings about a change of action. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 says, that Peter, and sa Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thirdly, you should confess that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, we read that, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For... With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then fourthly, you must be baptized, immersed, in order to have your sins washed away. Mark 16 verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Folks, these are the things that you need to do to be saved. The Holy Spirit has spelled it out for us in His Word. Well, we are so thankful that you have taken the time to be with us as we continue to study the Holy Spirit. We ask that you'll come back and join us for more in-depth studies. Sitting at the feet of Jesus Oh, what words I hear Him say Happy place so near, so precious May it find me there each day Sitting at the feet of Jesus, I would look upon the past. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at tftw.org. The preceding program was a production of Truth for the World, a work of the Duluth Church of Christ.